privilege to welcome you all to our CMJ event, 36 devices, and I know some of those are multiple, so we're way past 40 of us this afternoon. It's great that they, uh, you can take time aside uh, and to join with us. It's an encouragement to us, and I'm sure uh, we hope that as Mark brings God's word to us, it will be an encouragement to you as well. So thank you very much for setting your time aside. Mark is new to CMJ Things, so uh, he's, a number of you are new today, especially to this event, so you are given a very special welcome. Um, just to introduce Mark, he's a widely travelled gent. He, uh, he was previously in India as a missionary and was the world, uh, Arab World Ministries National Director, so bobbed all over the world uh, doing various things in Arab countries. Um, currently, if you follow his Facebook page, he occasionally gets out on his bike around Shepshed. So there's quite a contrast between the normal life for Mark, jetting all over the world and the current arrangements. But that's not unusual, is it? As we're all caught up in these strange and wonderful times. Um, if I can exaggerate it just a little. Um, perhaps just as a, an aside, Mark, took us all on an international conference to Chiang Mai in Thailand. And uh, as the international director, he knew where to go and eat. And off, and off we all set. I'm looking forward to a really nice Thai meal. And he took us to American Burger Bar. How about that? So I'm glad to say Mark's feasting us today, not on an American Burger Bar, but we're going to be in Hebrews chapter three. And his title today will be Holding Fast to your confidence. I'll open in prayer and then I'll hand over to Mark. Let's pray. Loving God and Father, we just commit our time to you. May all the arrangements go smoothly and may your word be a blessing to each one that's uh, online today. So Father, we just look for you to be amongst us, with us and be part of all that's done. And bless Mark in his presentation and preaching today. Amen. Over to you, Mark. Thanks very much, Don. Can everybody hear me? Okay, you can stick your thumbs up. That'd be great. Okay. I'm sorry I can't see all of you. I think I'd need a, a bigger a bigger screen, but uh, it's good to good to be here. Um, as uh, John has introduced me, that's very kind. Yes, I can't get out and about, and uh, my wife is wishing that I would, um, but uh, hopefully we'll get there soon. That would be good. Uh, yeah, just to introduce myself, uh, I do live in Shep Shed near Loughborough um, and uh, I have three children. They've all left home, uh, which is very sad when we're so locked down and we don't have so much to, <laughs> to talk about now. But um, in terms of their lives, they're uh, two are married, one's about to get married and uh, we're expecting our first grandchild. So that all seems very, very unreal. So, yeah. So, uh, as John said, I was the, the CEO of Arab World Ministries for the, up until January last year and uh, did that for nearly seven years. Uh, and yes, got to see much of the Middle East. Um, not so much of Israel, which is a shame, but uh, I would like to certainly revisit that country at some point. Great, so let's get into uh, what we're looking at today. Um, if you keep Hebrews 3 open, um, I'm just going to go through the first six voices, uh, six verses. And um, uh, in order to do that, I just want to give us a little bit of background to start with. Um, <clears throat> so a, a bit of background to Hebrews itself. Um, it's a fascinating book um, and so full of uh, theology, so full of uh, the things that we need to know as believers, um, but I'm only going to be able to concentrate on a small section today, so hopefully that will be okay. Um, despite the fact, I'm not going to tell you who wrote the, the letter, so um, if, sorry if you're disappointed, um, but we can deduce some things about the person who actually wrote the book. Most commentators agree that the person is male, um, probably not a first-generation apostle, in other words, was one removed from someone who walked physically with Jesus while he was on the earth. Um, he's very good at a prevalent style of debate of the day known as rhetoric. So he was, it's, it's the kind of 
language that you would find in a courtroom, for instance. So it's, it's that kind of style. He was a guy of high intelligence. And you can see from the themes that he touches in, in, in Hebrews, um, a breathtaking display of theology. So I hope that you find, you see some of that today. Um, Biblica thinks the author was a master of the Greek language of the day, although he was thoroughly acquainted with the pre-Christian Greek uh, translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, which he regularly quotes. And it's probable that this letter was written prior to the destruction of Jerusalem, since it's not mentioned at all. That's not conclusive, but this would date it at around AD 70 or just pre AD 70. Okay, as to purpose, what's the purpose of Hebrews? Um, commentary on Hebrews by James Thompson, which is really good, said the purpose of Hebrews is to reorient, reorient a community that has been disoriented by the chasm between the Christian confession of triumph and the reality that it is experiencing. So in reality, here is a Jewish, uh, Jewish believers in Christ who are experiencing intense persecution where they are and are wondering what's the disconnect between uh, the triumphant Christ and all that's associated with that and what they're experiencing. So they're probably flagging from the amount of persecution that they have experienced. So let's, let's crack on. Let's have a look at uh, Hebrews 3, 1 to 6, if you want to follow along in your version. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honour than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. Father, we just ask that you'll bless this word to us and help us to understand it. May your words come through and not mine, in Jesus' name. So this is the first time in Hebrews so far that the writer actually addresses his audience directly. And the imagery he's using is a comparison between the journey out of Egypt and around the wilderness to the promised land. And the promised land imagery is holding true here, although I don't think he's actually re referring to a physical location. And the overarching theme that you'll find in Hebrews is belief in God and looking at those who do believe in God and the outworking of those who choose not to or who don't believe in God. He's speaking to believers who are believing in the promise of eternal life through Jesus but are of a Jewish background. Now the writer to the Hebrews has just told the community in chapter two that the very fact that Jesus took an earthly body meant that he was tempted in every way that we are and yet remained without sin and is able to relate with, to the fact that we face temptation in exactly the same way. Often we can feel in our Christian lives like um, people don't understand or even that God doesn't understand but that would be wrong wouldn't it because Jesus has gone before us he took on a human body and was tempted in every way that we are and yet remained without sin so his humanity if you like connects us to Jesus in a, in a way that no other connection could he has it he has if you put it another way walked a mile in our shoes although I'm sure he didn't wear shoes in exactly the same way so we have a pioneer in Jesus, someone who has gone before. And when we pray to him, we pray to one who understands what we are going through as human beings. So bearing that in mind, the writer to the Hebrews now develops the this, this theme further. So in verse one there, he's, he talks about our calling. 
you, you who share in the heavenly calling, consider Jesus. So what is that calling? I don't know what you think about when you, you consider the word calling. You know, calling has become much more of a word that's used in business these days. And, uh, you know, sometimes they, would, they wouldn't necessarily call it a calling, but they might call it purpose. And certainly for new generations coming up, um, having purpose or a calling or a vocation or something where they believe they're going to make a difference in the world is important. So just as a kind of rhetorical question, what do you think of when you hear the word calling? Now, calling in this context is not primarily about a location or a role. Uh, that's secondary in, in, in the sense of we are primarily called to follow Jesus. And I think sometimes as Christians, we can think more about what's our calling. In, the, in other words, what are we called to do or called to to get to get involved in rather than that rather than come back to the primary calling on our lives which is really simply just to follow Jesus that's ah, simple isn't it really easy to do so I can stop there <laughs> but there's so much to that isn't there we, we do want to follow Jesus it's good to be reminded that that's our primary calling that first and foremost Jesus has said come follow me and we, when we follow Jesus, because he is the one who gave up his life for us. He's the one who suffered and bled and died so that we might live. One of the verses in the Bible that, um, that I wrestle with the most is John 10, 10, where Jesus says that we, he has come that we might have life and have life in all its fullness. And um, uh, John and I have talked about this before, but I am really keen to see that life in all its fullness. And I don't believe we actually often scratch the surface of the fullness of the life that God and Jesus is offering us. So that's our primary calling, to, to live a fulfilled and abundant life through Jesus. But the writer then uses this word consider, consider Jesus. That's quite a weighty word, isn't it? When you think about it, consider Jesus. And the word used here is katanoio, okay? So there's a little bit of Greek for you. <laughs> and basically means that you need to observe fully. So within the word is the idea of full engagement. In other words, do not be distracted, but focus wholly on this. Think intentionally, reflect about Jesus and who he is. It almost implies to the exclusion of everything else, to be fully focused. It requires us to get to know him. Um, I don't know what, you know, what you're like when, when, uh, when you're driving, um, but if I get lost, for some unknown reason, I have to turn the radio off and I have to try and concentrate on where I'm going. In other words, I want to be, there to be no distractions. If I'm really, really lost, I might actually ask somebody the directions, <laughs> you understand? But we need to actually focus to the exclusion of other things. Sometimes people, when you're really concentrating on something, you're reading a book or, or looking at a film, you may actually not hear them because you're so intent on what you're doing that it's to the exclusion of other things. And I think this is the, this is the intensity with what the writer to Hebrews is trying to get us to understand. When you think about Jesus, concentrate on him to the exclusion of other things. Consider, it means to actually ruminate on who, Je on who Jesus is. So when you can't get somebody to, if, when, you, when you're kind of ignoring somebody, perhaps you could just say, you could be very spiritual and say, I'm just considering Jesus at this point in time, but we do need to consider Jesus. We need to understand who he is. We need to know him well. I suppose another word that you could use is meditate. And as we know, meditation is not about emptying our minds, as the world would believe, but it's actually filling our minds with the truth um, of, of the word of God and truth about Jesus. And we can, we can consider him in different ways. We can consider how he has impacted our lives, what he's done in, a, in terms of in and through us. We can consider him as a person, how he interacted with people when he was on earth. But the important thing is to consider him. 
And that actually means that we've got to intentionally set aside time to do it. Then the writer to Hebrews does a very unusual thing, I think. He refers to Jesus as the apostle and high priest. I don't know whether you've ever heard of a, a sermon or a preach on Jesus as an apostle. Um, but here is what, he, what the writer to Hebrews describes him as. Uh, so I don't often think about Jesus in this way. Yet, if you think about it, the description is quite appropriate. When we consider the meaning of the word apostle as being one who is sent. Now, some commentators think that this refers to the fact that Jesus is the message sent from God. Now, I don't think we can argue with that. He is definitely the message sent from God, as we see from John 1. But I think we can have a little bit of license to go a bit further than that. And the word can also be translated, certainly at the time would have been translated as ambassador, one who represents one kingdom in another. And I think implicit in that, in the mind of the, the writer to Hebrews, um, would be the Roman understanding of this word at the time, which is where an ambassador, ambassador sent from Rome to another nation would want to create the culture of Rome in that place, buildings that were like Rome. If you, you know, you know your um, archeology, span you'll know that that was what happened. And the idea was that if the emperor ever visited that place, he would believe he was still in the same kingdom. And, and I think that's quite a useful illustration for us that we actually carry the kingdom of God wherever we go. So God should feel at home in his kingdom, wherever we are. We are designed to have impact for his kingdom wherever we go. Now, I must admit, it might have been easier for the ambassador to transplant Rome into those places because he was ambassador there because the army of Rome had already conquered the place. Otherwise, I think others might have had something to say <laughs> about what he was doing. But Jesus himself indicated that he was sent as well. In John 17, verse 18, he said, as you sent me into this world, so I have sent them into the world, as he's praying there in Gethsemane. So as we consider that, we should take comfort that Jesus was sent first, and now in the same way is sending us, so that Jesus has brought the kingdom of God to earth, and now we carry the kingdom of God into the different places that we go. And the question we have to have is, what impact are we having for God's kingdom in the places where we are? It's um, perhaps a little more virtual at the moment, but actually we are, you know, we're supposed to have streams of living water going through us. We're supposed to affect the places that we are. It's interesting to me that part of the Lord's Prayer says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'm not sure that we actually really think that through all the time and think, what does that actually look like? How, will that, how is it that, that, that heaven affects the earth? More of that a bit later. He's also referred to as the high priest, not just here, but in also in chapter five, we see he's a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. And Melchizedek was the king that uh, met with, um, with Abraham after the battle where he rescued his nephew. The high priest's role in the Old Testament was to represent God to the people as a kind of mediator, someone who stands between. And Jesus was the ultimate mediator in that he bridged the relationship divide between man and God by sacrificing himself. He was the ultimate high priest in that through his own death and resurrection, he did away with the need for the constant offering of sacrifices. And the imagery of this is powerful. Up until that time, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies in the temple, I think once a, once a year on the Day of Atonement. And we understand from the Old Testament that this required a great deal of preparation. Sacrifices had to be made to atone for the sin of the high priest and he had to go through all sorts of ceremonial washing. Even then, it might not be enough as he goes in to face God behind that curtain. I can imagine that as the high priest approached the curtain, there might have been some nerves as he did that. And I like the practicality of the Jewish people they couldn't go behind the curtain, but they could tie a rope around his ankle just in case he didn't make it and they could pull him out that way. The contrast, though, when Jesus died, or if you like, as the Hebrew writer to the Hebrew says, went through the curtain, 
is that this massive curtain was ripped in two. And as it said, and uh, atonement through Jesus was enough to satisfy the price of our sin. We don't need to sacrifice anymore. So all that Jesus did was a forerunner for us. Jesus, in the sense that he is God, came of his own volition. But it's also true that God appointed him both to the role of apostle and of high priest. He was supreme in both, but they were initiated in heaven. It also says that he's the high priest of our confession. And now, interestingly, confession has a kind of negative connotation in our culture, doesn't it? The idea of owning up to something. And I have to admit that I've confessed a few things like that when I was younger. Uh, things that you know you should have done but you didn't or things that you shouldn't have done and you did but confession is also about that which you declare as being part of who you are I mean I confess that Jesus is my Lord and Saviour I confess that he died for me I confess that his sacrifice on the cross was enough I can come through him to God the Father I'm made clean through his blood that's a confession and it's a confession we should do regularly so in that context, Jesus is the apostle, the sent one proclaiming the good news about the kingdom and the high priest. In verses two to four in particular, the writer is developing for these believers what he has already said about Moses. And you'll see constant references to the Old Testament throughout Hebrews. And his aim is to help them understand how much more is Jesus in this faith we call Christianity than Moses was in all his greatness in bringing the law down from Mount Sinai. Moses is one of the most significant figures for Jew Jewish people as we know. And the writer is using this to give these believers from a Jewish background a context to understand how significant Jesus is. I guess for us, it might be a bit like choosing a person of significance to our nation. Maybe, I mean, if you'll excuse the analogy, maybe somebody like Winston Churchill, who it seems God used to great effect in the Second World War. And he was a great man, and I think he had some kind of faith as well, you might say. And you might say he's appointed for that very role at that very hour and time. But just like Moses is inferior to Jesus Christ, so is he inferior to Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God. And Moses for the Jewish nation was a person of huge importance in that he led the children of Israel out of Egypt. Moses represented the giving of the law. We forget, though, don't we, sometimes that the first covenant actually was made with Abraham, that the law was not the covenant. It was a way in which God gave instructions to the Israelites that described how they were to actually interact with God and gave language to the fact that they were sinful. I'm guessing in one sense that God hoped that the covenant given through Abraham wouldn't require this, but it did seem that actually he had to spell it out for them through the law. Uh, this is the way to approach me. This is the way that you do life with me. So Moses was right up there in terms of reverence and honour. And they would know, for instance, that the face of Moses had shone after he came down from speaking to God, that he was described as a friend of God, as someone whom God spoke to face to face. So an incredible, incredibly important man, but not the son. An illustration is used here in verse three around house building. It says, understand this, that the person who builds the house has more honor than the house itself. In other words, the creator, the designer, the one who is the source of this concept is greater. And what the writer to the Hebrews is saying is that the designer and architect should, there be, should be the focus, that when you look at this house, you should think about the person who designed it. Um, if you're going to use an analogy, it should, create, it should cause us to reflect on the creator who built it. Now, Moses, in this sense, is the house, which, whilst it has honour, does not have as much honour as the builder of the house. And the builder of the house is Jesus. My wife and I had the opportunity back in 2019 to visit the Grand Designs show live. Um, I've always been fascinated by buildings, uh, particularly the kind of buildings where they put boards up around the outside, you know, when they're building those big things and, and they go down first before they go up. You know, I'm, I'm just infinitely curious, especially when they don't put a hole in the wood so you can see through. You have to try and, and being short in stature, that's always a bit of a problem. But I'm always interested in the way that those buildings go up. 
But I can tell you one thing, when I see a building like that or a house, I don't assume it got there by accident. My assumption is that someone designed it and somebody built it. And it amazes me the creativity of people as they design houses in all shape, different shapes and sizes. But it didn't happen by chance, it happened by design. And the same is true of the world and the universe that we live in. The builder and designer of all things is God. Think about that for a moment. When God spoke, he said, let there be light. And as far as I know, he has not rescinded that command. It's still going. It's expanding at 186,000 miles per second, even as we speak, which is an amazing thought. But if we believe this statement, then we have to acknowledge that everything proceeds from God. The writer, remember, is speaking to believers, but believers who are culturally, ethically and theologically from a Jewish background. So he is careful to give honour to Moses that is Jew. Moses was really faithful as a servant and pointed towards someone more, someone greater in the future. Jesus is the son who has a superior glory than that which Moses carried at that time. Effectively, what the writer is saying here is that the law wasn't a bad thing, but we already know, don't we, that it was not effective in doing away with sin. It pointed the way to Christ who did deal with sin once and for all. So grace through Christ is more. It is a new covenant. It supersedes the law. It builds on the law because Jesus, he, he fulfilled all the requirements of the law, but it is better. So now we come to verse five and we see further emphasis is given. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. The word used for servant here in verse five is the kind of service that you would free, uh, uh, freely give. Um, so there was the, the, the tradition in the Old Testament, wasn't there, that if you had a servant and you, you let him go, um, that he could actually bind himself to you. And to do that, they would actually um, bore a hole in the, in, the servant, in the servant's ear to say that, they, they, that the servant wanted to be part of the family ongoing. And it's that kind of thing that's going on here, that, that, that Moses was the kind of servant saying, I just freely want to serve you forever. I mean, Moses is an amazing character, isn't he? I mean, when I think about Moses, I always think about the burning bush. But something changed Moses at that point. I know that Moses must have been a curious man because he was, you know, leading the sheep through the desert at the time, wasn't he? Now, I don't know how clear it was that this bush was burning or how far away it was. But it's interesting that the Bible actually records for us very clearly that Moses actually turned. He turned aside. And I think God notices when we turn aside and when we, when we actively go and intentionally go towards him to find out what's going on. And the writer here is really trying very, very hard not to diminish Moses in any sense, but he's emphasizing that Jesus is the son and that there's a difference there. And as the son, Jesus has also been faithful, hasn't he? Um, some people may infer that Jesus didn't have any decision in the, in, in, the, uh, in the way that he came to earth, but that would be wrong, wouldn't it? We know that he, had, uh, he decided to be obedient to God. We know that he came of his own volition. And I'm sure that it must have been, uh, we, could, we could talk all day about what it meant for Jesus to give up his uh, divinity in some way. And commentators all over the world would have, uh, would have that kind of conversation for the rest of the, the week, let alone the afternoon. But we need to understand that Jesus came of his own religion. He was faithful to what his father called him to do. He walked among us. He ate. He drank. He slept. And he did everything that we do, yet was without sin. And, and ultimately, he was obedient to death, even death on a cross. But the important thing to realize is that the son has an inheritance. 
He can do things that the servant cannot do, not because he's a better person, but because of who he is positionally. As I was thinking about this, I was thinking, well, how can I actually think about that in today's terms? It's not quite the same sort of thing, but we understand, don't we, that um, the queen generally doesn't kind of do all the things herself. You know, she doesn't um, look after Buckingham Palace, going around hoovering the place and cooking the meals and, you know, putting on a state banquet and getting down in the kitchen with her apron on. But what she does have is a, is a palace full of servants. Obviously they're paid servants, so it's maybe slightly different, but they are servants nonetheless. And I suppose if you think about those servants, they can work their way up in the household, can't they? And some servants, you know, do go to, uh, do come to high position within, within the household. But trusted and faithful and uh, close as they might be to the royal family, they can never have the same status along with the accompanying rights of a child of the monarch. The child of the monarch has different things because of who they are. And it's the same here. Moses was a great man and he testified of what was to come. And Jesus was, was what, to, what was to come. Moses did amazing things, don't get me wrong. And I think, you know, we can look at Moses and say, wow, what an amazing character. You know, stays up on a mountain for 40 days and nights, doesn't eat, comes down brightly shining, it would seem. And, uh, you know, just the things that he did. And yet, even in that situation, was not able to go into the promised land. So Hebrew believers focus, need to focus now on Jesus, on the son, on the one who has much more glory. So fix your eyes on Jesus is what the Hebrews, the writer to the Hebrews is saying. Moses was only somebody, a signpost to something that is better. Moses brought the law. And I think it was possible to fulfill the law as Jesus did, but, mo but, but nobody else did. So it was not enough. Something more was needed. So finally, the writer makes this assertion that we are his house. It's a very odd kind of thing to say, isn't it? Oh, you look like a house. But some people might be a bit more offended about that. But actually, we need to understand what is being spoken of here. So we're going to delve back a bit into the Old Testament to think about this. Now, I, I, I hope you understand that, that um, when, you know, the writer to the Hebrews, very understandably, is not referring to whether we are a Barrett home here. He is talking about something different. He's talking about us being the house where God dwells. Now, actually, we don't think that's a big deal. I think we take that for granted. But actually, it was a huge deal. As we, work, as we work our way back, you can look back into Genesis. And the idea of the house of God originates with Jacob. You remember that Jacob... Um, was kind of a bit of a schemer, uh, along with his mother, had done some, some difficult and, and possibly dangerous things. <laughs> um, but he, he finds himself in this place where he had a dream. And the dream was really, really vivid. In fact, it was still with him when he woke up. I don't know whether you've ever had that. Some dreams that you might have, um, you might remember when you wake up. Um, usually it just takes somebody to talk to me, then I've forgotten all that's gone before. <laughs> But if you think it's significant, then you might write it down. Interestingly, in my previous role with Arab World Ministries, we used to have many, many testimonies of, um, of Muslims who have had dreams and visions of Jesus. You know, Jesus had come to them in their dreams uh, and sometimes in their waking uh, visions before they come to him in faith. And I think it's one of those things that's, that's true of the region, that, that actually they would uh, give much more weight to those kinds of things. Uh, some of us might think, oh, um, you know, what's going on if, if Jesus suddenly appeared in front of us? Um, but actually, dreams and visions like that are much more common in that part of the world, and they would give much more significance to them. But the reality is that God does still interact with us in exactly the same way. So for Jacob, he had had to leave his mother and father because of his scheming, and because his brother Esau wants to kill him for stealing his birthright. 
I think it certainly puts into perspective some of our family quarrels, doesn't it? Um, hopefully they're not quite that bad. Um, but here we got Jacob's had to leave his house. In fact, he'll never see his mother alive again. He gets to a point in his journey where he lays down for the night. And whilst he is asleep, he dreams of a stairway or a ladder that reaches into and from heaven on which angels are going up and down. And this is what Jacob says in the morning, and we can find it in Genesis 28, verse 17. He said he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. It must have been a pretty uh, amazing dream to actually jolt Jacob enough out of his own selfish considerations to think, I'm actually in the presence of God here. And I've seen angels descending and ascending. And the Hebrew word for the house of God, I'm sure you know, is Bethel. Or Bethel, I think they would probably say. But Bethel is the house of God. And there's a progression that goes through the Old Testament about this idea of the house of God. Genesis 28, 17 is the first reference where we see this, this uh, term, the house of God. And then Moses is given the blueprint for the tabernacle on, on, on the mountain uh, in Exodus 25 to 27. And in one sense, it's a temporary structure and yet a place which is again designed to focus on God. This is a house of God. This is a place where God dwells. And then as you keep going through the Old Testament, you come to, um, to David, who really has that desire to build a house for God. And it's a great desire. And God doesn't say that condemn him for having that thought, but says you're not the person to, to build it. But he certainly believed in it, didn't he? Because he actually stockpiled gold, silver, bronze in great quantities so that, the, that his son could build a magnificent temple for, for God. And that's exactly what Solomon does. It takes him um, seven years or so to build the temple of God and and it's magnificent, and that is where God dwells. And then we see that temple is destroyed, and then we have the second temple built by the Jews returning from exile in Ezra 3, verses 10 to 13. We can see that. We see the people weeping because those that remember the previous temple think it's not as good, and those who have never seen one are thinking they're joyful because, you know, now is this place that we can, we can worship God in. And for the, for the Jewish nation, the temple was the, was the focus because this is where God dwells. We go and we do these things. We get washed, we make sacrifices and we come into the presence of God. It was a really significant and important thing. So when we see this happening, when, when this reference is made in Hebrews about the house of God, you kind of wonder, was that always God's intention? Yes, he put himself in a temple. He put himself behind a curtain. It was the Holy of Holies because people were, were not reverent enough. Some of you may have seen in the Old, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, the, uh, the, the phrase, the fear of the Lord, or in Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And sometimes it's difficult to think, well, what does that actually mean? But actually, it means to, to, to worship God with awe and wonder, with awe and wonder. And we can only get to that place of awe and wonder when we stop and we consider God, when we consider Jesus. When I was in India, one of the things I love to do is to go outside at night. And nightfall would be around about 6 or 6.30 in the evening. We generally got about 12 hours of daylight. And, the, you know, where we were, there were just not many, very many street lights. And the number of stars that you could see on a night like that was just amazing. You could just, you know, it actually ended up with a crick in your neck because you'd be let there standing there so long and thinking about the fact that, that God called out every single one of those stars. I think sometimes we need to get to a place of awe and wonder to understand just what it is to approach this God who has made us and has made all these different things. Hopefully you are similarly intrigued. Uh, my curiosity in things like that knows no bounds. But anyway, that's another story. I think there are whispers of what God's intention was. We see them 
in Jeremiah 31, 33. He says, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. I honestly don't think it was ever in God's mind to be that distant, that, you know, the kind of distance inferred by sacrifice and all of the kind of things of the law. And it's interesting, isn't it? The events that surrounded uh, Jesus moved the earth literally. One of the visible effects of Jesus' death was to remove that curtain. And that curtain was 60 foot high and six inches thick. I think it's interesting that the Bible records for us that it was torn from top to bottom. Now, I know how tall I am, and I'm certainly not 60 feet high. So I think it's just, just you know, it's like God in a humorous way in one sense saying, nobody else did that. That was me. And this is when it all changed. Until that point within Judaism, there was a physical location you went and met with God. And since the time of the Garden of Eden, I believe it has been in God's heart to be in relationship with us side by side or since Jesus' ascension with the Holy Spirit residing in us to be in our hearts. And the writer to the Hebrew qualifies this statement about being in his house. It is true that we are the house of God as we follow Jesus, which we did as we accepted him into our life, but also as we continue to believe in him. The spirit of God lives in and through us. In other words, a continual, I still believe in you. I still want to follow you. It's a daily thing. But in order to be this house of God, we need to hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. The confidence that we have or assurance that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. And no one can come into relationship with God except through him. He is the reason for our hope. We know through Jesus that this COVID thing will, will end. This too will pass. God is the only eternal thing. We can and do face different challenges. And they can at times seem to almost upend us. But the fact is that we continue in hope because we believe that the best way of knowing ourselves is to know God. And the end of the passage leads us back to the beginning. How do we hold fast to our confidence? How do we keep hope? The writer to the Hebrews has shown us. It is in, in chapter three, verse one. As we consider Jesus, as we think about what he did on the cross for us, as we think about what he's doing in our lives, as we focus on the way he lived his life and the extraordinary things he did, which were a foretaste of what he wanted for us. After all, Jesus did say, did he not, that you will do greater things, which I think basically means more of, not necessarily greater in the sense of scale and power. But all of this requires belief, not just as we take the first steps in our faith, but continually day by day. For the Jews, great as, Mo great as Moses was, he was not the son. Moses was faithful. The Bible describes him as a friend of God. I'd be grateful if I was known that way myself. But Jesus is the son. He too is faithful. And Romans 8 verse 17 says, we are heirs and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may share in his glory. Our heavenly destiny is ours. And there is a sense that we have not yet come into all of it. As we set out on this journey of faith, initially believing that Jesus is he who he said he was, then in order to come into all that God has for us, we need to remain in belief. Doesn't mean you've got it all worked out. You can, you can always make sense of what's happening, but it is choosing to believe that in spite of all we face, Jesus is worthy of our trust and we're willing to follow him daily. Heaven is now and much more than we think. That's another sermon. But there is the hope that as yet we have not seen and tasted all that we will. In, in, all, in it all, in the middle of the trials and tribulations, keep your focus on Jesus, who promises never to leave us and never to forsake us. In John 16, 33, he said, I have said all these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have come up, overcome the world. In other words, hold fast to your confidence. Amen. Thanks, Mark, for that great, the great encounter of those six verses. We'll be glad to know if nobody put any questions up in the chat. 
Now, that doesn't mean there's no questions because this audience often put their hand up and they don't always do it using the Zoom facilities, but they're welcome to, or they just stick a big hand in front of the screen. So let's just pause and see if anybody has any questions. Or they might even just unmute themselves and come in. Look at David. Is. David's getting ready to, to make a statement. Are you going for it, David? Nope, he's sitting back. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, you know in, in John John 14 when Jesus says that he's going to prepare a place for us, do you think that illustrates your theme of house and focus on builder? Because when we get to that place that he's prepared for us, our focus isn't on our house, is it? It's on our on our Saviour and on the Lord and on Christ and God Himself. Yeah, whether it's actually a physical location, it may be, I don't know, but um, I think it's, it gets us to think about what, it's a place where we can belong, a place, a place where we are part of, when well, you think about the Jewish, uh, obviously the kind of idea of going and building a place to bring your betrothed back to, then it, 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 I suppose it, it more illustrates the fact that, that we are his betrothed, you know, in that sense, that, that he's bringing us back as part of the marriage uh, of church and Jesus. But uh, yeah, I, I think there's probably dimensions of that that we, we don't know about yet. But, but I think it's that sense of belonging and part, being part of being brought into the family and just underlying and reinforcing that. Okay, thanks, Mark. You can see Alex has unmuted himself. Is that because you've got a question, Alex? I have. I, I've, I've also put my hand up. Can you see no, that? My apologies. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Failing chairman. I, uh, hi, 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 Mark. Thank you so hi. much. I think um, you know when when the good sign is I want to reread uh, Hebrews chapter three, having listened to those that teaching. I suppose, as in one sense, it's a really tough theological question. I think a lot lots of people wrestle with, and I'm not expecting an answer. Just want for us to engage with you on this in some way. But what what you're saying, I think, is absolutely right. That no one apart from Jesus himself lived out the Torah, the law, faithfully everybody else falls short well, I suppose my theoretical question is this in terms of the atonement if you did live out the Torah faithfully would you be saved in your understanding yeah I think I've always thought that that, that has to have been a possibility otherwise it's, it's like something you can never achieve I think the very fact that Jesus made a way for us by achieving it kind of proves that it was possible I think so, but yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it is a deep theological question. Um, but I, I think my, my feeling has always been that it must have been possible to do it, but I guess God in his infinite wisdom would know that nobody would achieve it. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? Incoming Alison, I think. No. Yeah. So following on from that then, um, Jesus made the Torah more difficult. So which Torah are we talking about? Do you want to explain that so, a bit more? I'm sorry. So he said, um, yeah, it, it says in the in the Torah, if you murder somebody, then you have to be stoned or whatever. But I say to you, if you get angry with your brother. Right. So how far are we? I mean, you can take rabbinic, lots and lots of different rabbinic interpretations. I'm doing a course at the moment on mm. some interpretation of the first three words of Genesis. But um, how far do you have to take the Torah to be perfect? It's a great question. And I think I think in, I think intent really does go to the to the heart of what. God is saying to us that actually, it you know He said, didn't He, in, in the um, that the heart of man is is deceitful, and uh, I think you're right. I think I think Jesus was just illustrating perhaps the impossibility of actually keeping the law in that sense. That actually it's not about keeping rules and regulations. It's actually about a heart condition that changes us. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a really good point. I think that's very true. Yeah. See Frank's got his uh, virtual hand up. Frank, would you like to unmute yourself? Hi there. Yep. 
Um, just an observation, really. Um, there's a minority view among scholars, um, only a few, but some um, one or two that I've talked to. Uh, and I find it an attractive view, it's only a minority view, that Hebrews was written not to um, Jewish Christians in general, but in particular to converted priests. Um, and I find that helpful. I think all the emphasis on the temple and the ritual, you know, these people were people who were missing their identity, they're missing their status, um, their lives were very much bound up with the temple worship. Uh, and they're really very tempted to go back and reclaim their identity. Um, and I find that all this emphasis on in Hebrews on, uh, on the temple and the ritual and what it meant um, takes on a greater depth and a greater meaning if it's written to people whose, whose big temptation is to go back and reclaim what they lost. Mm. Therefore, Jesus is the great high priest means don't go back and reclaim your own priesthood because you've got a Melchizedekian priest who's, who's bigger and better than that. Um, so it is a minority view, but it's one that I find interesting and, and, and quite helpful. People yeah. like Donald Guthrie, F.F. F. Bruce, Lovday, yeah. Alexander, who I've talked to in, embrace that view. And uh, I, I think it's an interesting and helpful one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It gives a different perspective, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Fine. Going back to the previous point, um, you said that um, Someone said, can we keep the Torah? Well, Jesus explained this. He said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. This is the whole of the Torah. And it's the Holy Spirit who can do that. John Wesley was very keen on this. It's the Holy Spirit living and working in us that keeps the law as God intended. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, thanks, Paul. And a further point, if I may, if I may get in. You think the emphasis of Hebrews on angels has yeah. any significance today? Yes, that's, that's, a, that's a good too. Yeah, that's a good one for another day. Because <laughs> yeah. you mentioned a lot about Moses. But I kept thinking of the angels as well. Absolutely, yes. The angels gave the law, yeah. Thank you. Mm. Any other questions? I'm not seeing any virtual hands, and I'm not seeing any physical hands. Well, I am flicking between the screens, so my apologies if I have missed anybody. Ah, Handley. Handley. Handley, sorry. Hello. Are we any nearer knowing, uh, in terms of the latest research, who the author of Hebrews was? <laughs> um, no, there's still quite a bit of debate, actually. I think it's still out there. Um, I, I don't know. Yeah, there, there are obviously different schools of thought, you know, John, Paul, different people. But I don't think we are any closer to conclusion, is what I, at least... In, in the, I, the commentaries I've read don't seem to be indicating that, but an interesting question, certainly. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. So, Alex, do you have another question? Yeah, just, just to follow up with what Mark and, and Hanley has been discussing, I, I suppose it would be fair to say, Mark, I don't know if, if, if you know, be interesting what other people think, but in terms of recent momentum, most of the newer commentaries are, are quite strong on Lucan authorship of Hebrews, which I think is an interesting idea. Um, so I suppose, you know, if we are forced to put a favourite in the race, it might well be Luke at this stage, looking at the common literature. But I, you know, I just offer that out there, really. The, the Thank literature. you. I didn't know that. Yeah. Thank you. We are all to date now. No more hands in virtual or physical forms. I'm going to thank Mark and appreciate his time in preparation and in delivery to us this afternoon. Thank you for all of you that stayed with us. Uh, the numbers continue to grow, and at one point we had 43 devices, and I know lots of you were doubled up, so I reckon we were approaching 50 folks with us this afternoon, and that's amazing. Uh, so thank you for not sledging and snowballing and um, building your snowmen uh, on a day like today. Maybe you've got bored doing that as well in lockdown. Can I just share some 
uh, events that are going on. If you're wanting to be with us next month, it's not at two in the afternoon. It's one of our CMJ Shofar events. So it's 7.30 um, next, next month on the 10th of March. And Andrea Williams of Christian Concern will be talking to us. And so she'll be an interesting one to give us a very much a, a, a contemporary view of the world in which we live and how we as Christians can respond to it. So that'll be Andrea Williams on the 10th of March at, at 7.30. Obviously, it will be online and there'll be details on our website and social media. Tonight, those of you that love your Zoom events, we've got our follow up because it's the prayer evening uh, this evening, uh, 6.30. And that, and not only will there be a UK update, but our guest will be Sandy Shoshine, Shoshani, who uh, works with um, the um, Christian uh, anti-abortion uh, support groups out in Israel. Got lots of links, Alison Marchant, and so many of you involved in setting that up. If Jane is still on. Jane, do you want to just mention, give a better bio than I'm doing on that one? <clears throat> yeah, sure. Um, there's a lovely link with Sandy Shoshani and CMJ. Her and her husband managed the guest house for quite a few years, and I can't remember what time that was. In the 90s. In the 90s, yeah. Um, but... Uh, Another link with the pro-life work in Israel and CMJ is that um, the pro-life work there was founded by the likes of the wonderful Alison March and Ted Walker, David Pelegi. And um, so, and I know that, you know, pro-life work is very close to our hearts in the UK. It just seems crazy that they, you know, their abortion statistics are horrific. So it's wonderful that we love Sandy and she's, a little bundle of dynamite. So please do come along and uh, hear about the work and get to pray alongside her for it. Thank that's you. Thing. Thanks, Janie. So that's 6.30 this evening. And um, the links are on the website, on Facebook, etc. And the weekly email has gone out and all the details are in there. If you're wanting to have an event for next week, on the 16th, uh, Alex is speaking at uh, Cambridge at Hepsi Bar, and uh, he'll be all the more encouraged by seeing your faces amongst that crowd too. So if you've got a spare evening, that's at seven o'clock on the 16th of February. So I think there's no more for me to do other than hand over to Alex. Thank you very much, John. Thank you for hosting. And I just wanted to say before we close, thank you to Mark so much teaching there i was so encouraged really about this central point you were making that whatever our calling is and there's various callings in this room that the prime calling is is our commitment to jesus as lord and savior so mark thank you so much for for rooting your talk in him and uh, in, in 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 your obvious love and knowledge for the scriptures mark we're, we're indebted to you so thank you i'd like to close uh, in prayer just before I do that, if you um, want a little bit more opportunity to think about this, there's a really good Olive Press paper, which you can download for free from the CMJ UK website by John Atkinson. John, you might know John is key key worker in South Africa. Back in 2013, which seems a long time ago now, issue 19 is Yeshua, a prophet like Moses. And he does a lot of work on the Hebrews free text. So that's issue 19, 2013. Yeshua, a prophet like Moses, and you can download all the other press papers from the CMJ website. So uh, that's an opportunity. Let's pray for Mark and close the meeting in prayer. Thank you. Father God, thank you for raising up and equipping men and women who can teach your word faithfully. Thank you for the opportunities we have to question and to reflect and to learn from each other. And Lord, we ask a blessing on every person listening in this afternoon. And we pray a special blessing on Mark. So, Lord, help us now to go knowing your peace and your presence. In the name of the Lord, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Bless you. Thanks for having me. Yes, we are all welcome to unmute and have a natter now. Or if you want to have, ask further questions of Mark, you're more than welcome. We're not in any rush to... Uh, 
depart or even ask any questions of CMJ. Thank you very much for everybody being online. Thank you for the comments that have been coming through on the chat. Obviously, a, a lot of appreciation for Mark sharing with us this afternoon. So I hope you've been able to see those as well, Mark. Just a big thank you to Mark. Brilliant. Excellent. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Frank. Yeah. That's okay. John, we missed most of that because we came in late. Where's the recording from? Uh, I think we have to do a confessional first, don't we? Uh, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've recorded it on Zoom, so once we've got it sorted, we'll uh, put it up on the YouTube site, I think, where is where Pip normally puts it. Watch that space. Uh, David and uh, Pip will perhaps send you an email just to flag it up. Thank you. John Frank wanted to speak. Go for it, Frank. No, I just said my bit. I said a big thank you to Mark. That was it. Oh, you still had your hand up. Sorry. <laughs> Great. Well, we appreciate your each one of you that's taken the time aside to come with us on this journey. And we do appreciate all that Mark's done. It's the quietest crowd ever, Mark. You've stunned them into <laughs> violence. Mm -hmm. Stunned. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you very much. Nice to meet you all. Mm -hmm. Nice. Bye. 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 Bye.